I can't touch it. Uh, okay, I'm good to go if uh, guys want to get ready. All right, um, this type talk's going to be pretty tight in terms of time, so I'm just going to kind of jump into it now. Um, yeah, sometimes, I think uh, Eric mentioned me earlier, I work on Spire at night. Uh, during the day, I work for Fluxid Analytics. Um, so the main over, so I'm just going to, pardon? Um, yeah, so the main thing here is that, you know, you're sitting there and you're implementing some numeric algorithm, um, and you want to use floating point because it's fast. Um, more importantly, floating point generally is good enough most of the time. I'm sure whenever you guys are doing it, use double, and things usually work. Um, the problem is what happens when it doesn't, and you get errors. Uh, you really have three options. Um, you can continue using double like you were doing before. You live with the errors. This is probably the most common case, and everybody's generally happy with that. Uh, if you can't live with the errors, then you probably try to switch over to a higher precision type, like rational or big int or something like that. Um, that's a fine option, but the problem is it's a lot slower than just using primitive doubles. Um, but this talk is all about the third option, which is to use a floating point filter. Uh, the idea behind a floating point filter is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, you use a floating point uh, approximation to your, when you can, so you use double as long as you can, and when you can't use double, you don't. You use higher precision types. Makes sense, right? Uh, of course, the, the devil is in the details. Um, so. <laughs> Basically, the, the main idea behind floating point filters is that we, can, we um, solve our problem using like, a number type like double as usual, but while we're doing that, we also maintain an error bound on this number, on the approximation, so we know how bad it is. And what we do is then when we come to some point where we actually need to return a solution, we can then check to see if the error bound is, within, is acceptable, and if it's not, we can then fall back and reevaluate with, with an exact type. Um, there is a catch here which is that it is not good for answering questions like this. So you want to minimize the error. You say, what's the term of the metrics? You want to minimize that. It's not going to help you. Um, what it is good for, <laughs> so yeah, the, the problem is like, you know, it, it does not try to actually change your code to, to reduce the errors. What it's doing is just maintaining an error bound. So you still, those errors are still there. And where floating point numbers work well is when you're trying to do something that has, that you want to answer exactly. Um, and since because, you know, floating point numbers like a double, there's always a, they're always a little bit wrong because they're, they're just an approximation. They're never going to answer any question exactly. Um, a better question to ask of floating point filters is what is the sign of the determinant of my matrix? So you want to know, is it zero? So you know, can I actually solve this uh, matrix or not? Um, or if you want to know if it's positive or negative, we'll see an example of that later. The key here is that it's good when you need to make a decision. So you have a predicate you want to solve. You need to know some property of the number. Is it zero? Uh, what's the sign of this number? Um, and so, our floating point filter, it, it really is pretty simple. It's just a wrapper. Uh, you can see here we parameterize it on the type we're using. You generally want to parameterize it on exact type because that's its whole point in life. So exact types are big int, rational. Uh, Spire has one algebraic, and there's also no unreal. Um, and it provides a set of standard operators that it, can, that it knows how to compute the error bounds for. So these are things like you'd expect like addition, multiplication, division, but also things like square roots and end roots. Um, and as long as you stick with that, oh, um, what, what it promises is that it has these predicates. Uh, the, 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 the two main ones are sign them and compare. And what it says is that it'll try to use the floating point approximation for those. So you can, and if it can, it'll be fast. Um, the actual number type, there's really not a lot of magic. Uh, so you have our floating point approximation here, uh, pretty straightforward. These two little members here maintain our error bounds. I really don't want to get into that. If you want to learn more, uh, you can go read this paper. That's what the implementation is based off of. Um, it's pretty readable. Uh, and then we have whoop, a func here that um, represents our exact number type. So rather than actually evaluating the exact number type, we just shove it in a func to be evaluated later. Um, so obviously the real magic happens in the implementation, which is just a ton of macros. Um, and these macros are very important for a good reason, which is that uh, we want to be Relatively, we want to be close to the speed of doubles. And we can't do that if we have a whole bunch of allocations for every single operation. So what floating point filter does is it, for a given expression, it'll try to fuse all the operators together to get rid of intermediate allocations. And it'll take all those, all the error bound uh, maintenance calculations, the floating point approximations and everything else, and it inlines them. And all that, that funk you saw that evaluates the exact number type, um, it just gets turned into a def. 
And why it's important is that uh, defs just get turned to private methods. So we're never actually allocating a thunk. Instead, we're just eventually calling some private method. Um, and so an example here is we have a pretty simple expression, x plus y, we're getting the sign. Um, and this will turn it into this horrid mess. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow, but basically here we're inlining our x variable. Uh, here we're inlining our y variable. And then uh, down here we're basically doing the actual addition. And then finally we're doing the signum test here. Uh, but the one thing that's kind of hard to see in this is that the only time we'll ever actually allocate anything from that expression is at this very final little else here where we finally compute the signum. And this is in the case where the floating point approximation has failed and we need to fall back to the exact case. But there's no allocations preceding that. Um, so I wanted to motivate the use of this by giving some examples. I have two examples to show. I'm hoping I'll get through both of them. If not, tough luck. Um, but basically the first one is 2D orientation. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. We have three points. These points have some order. In this case, we're going P, Q, R. Uh, and we want to know if this is turned left or turned right. In this case, we've turned right. Uh, you know, in here, we've kind of switched the order a bit, and now we're turning left. There's also the degenerate case where we haven't turned at all, and we really want to know about that, too. Um, so this is a case where, once again, we're asking a question that can be answered exactly by floating point arithmetic most of the time. Um, so we're going to encode this test as just a type class. I'll call it turn. Uh, you can see here it just takes, our, our method just takes three points. Each line here is a point with the coordinates, um, and it returns a sign of, or the sign of the, uh, of, of the, sorry, I should yeah, mention here, the, the base, it doesn't matter. It's good. <laughs> um, anyway, so the first implementation here is just going to try to do what I think most people would do and I would certainly do first, which is just try to use double. So we just implement using straight double arithmetic. And that's great. It works most of the time. Um, so key here is really this line at the bottom here. All we're doing is we're generating a bunch of tests. We're, we have a line. We generate three points on that line. And then we just kind of perturb each point just a little bit. And as we move along the right of the axis, these points are getting perturbed less and less and less. And so we get closer and closer to actually being on a straight line. And you can see after, so this is basically the number of bits down in the double where we're perturbing it. So as we get further and further, we're getting smaller and smaller and closer to the line. And eventually we hit a point where doubles stop working and we get errors. Um, so if we wanted to implement this using just exact arithmetic, no floating point filters, you know, we'd probably just do this. We'd wrap the doubles in some exact type, like algebraic. Uh, we compute the sign, and of course the problem is this is very slow. I mean, it's a lot slower. Um, it's really hard to beat by a floating point arithmetic, or just like you know, pure doubles, primitive types. So we can try again, and we'll use floating point filter this time. Um, it looks, it is very similar to the other ones. The only thing is we're wrapping each each coordinate in a floating point filter first. This wrapping isn't actually allocating anything. They're all, it's just returning a value class here, uh, which is very important to, to remember. And then we just, we just write an expression like we would have anyways with the doubles. And the nice thing is we get good performance. It's no longer 10,000 times slower. It's about 40% of the speed of double, which I think for most people they'd be happy with if it means that you'll never be wrong. Um, obviously you can see once we start getting into the uh, exceptional cases where the points are very, very close to a line, the speed drops off, but that's okay. Those are like our 1% of cases or less. <coughs> so that example was sort of, we had uh, doubles and we wanted to basically make our, we had some, double, some test that uses doubles and we wanted to make it exact. Um, and so we use that. In this other case, we have an exact type and we want to make it faster, or we have an exact, uh, an algorithm that uses exact types and we want to make it uh, a little faster using floating point filters. Um, so I'm glad Eric introduced polynomials earlier. Um, but basically, you know, we have our polynomial here. The red line is our x-axis. And what we want to do is we, want, we have some interval. Uh, Spare provides a nice interval type to do this. Shoot. Um, so this is our interval here. And what we're told is that this interval will contain exactly one root. And what's nice is that, uh, so that's the root here. It's where it crosses the x-axis. And what's nice is that we know that on each side of our interval, the polynomial will have an opposite sign. So on the right side, it's positive, or negative. On the left side, it's uh, positive. And so what's, what I, uh, and the reason why I bring this up anyways is because I've been implementing uh, polynomial root finding, real roots anyways, uh, in Spire. 
And basically, as I was implementing this, I was trying to make it fast, obviously. Um, as Aspire itself, we've implemented this algorithm called quadratic interval refinement for real roots. Uh, so again, this is a pretty easy one to read, and the algorithm itself is pretty straightforward. Um, so we have, we're given an interval in a polynomial that has, in that we're told that the interval has one root in it, and we have this little parameter n, so in here n is eight. So we take our interval, we split it up into eight intervals. We then find, take the sequent, secant from the left and the right of the interval, and we find out where it intersects. We take that intersection point against the real line, we find the closest uh, line to that. And once we have that, then we ignore all the other lines except for the two on either side of it. And then what we do is, by testing the sign here, we can isolate exactly which interval may contain a root. In this case, we basically drop down and we find that we've reduced our interval, we've refined it, and hence, uh, interval refinement. The key for, <coughs> so I'm just gonna take a water. So the key part of uh, the quadratic interval refinement is that it then doubles the parameter n, and what this is doing is it's really saying that it assumes that we are uh, converging quadratically, so each time it doubles the number of intervals so that we double the number of bits that we've uh, calculated. Once again, it repeats as usual, we find the secant, we find the intersection point, and it's basically the root. Um, now the problem with this is that um, it requires two polynomial evaluations, and these are not sign tests, these are, we actually have to evaluate it, and more importantly, we have to evaluate it with really high precision. Um, we can't get around that, otherwise it won't actually converge quadratically, um, which is the whole point. Um, but the problem with a lot of these algorithms is that um, they, only, they only converge fast under certain assumptions. And QIR is no different, and that assumption is generally that you have to be, your interval has to be pretty small to start with and close to the root. And if it's not, our test can actually fail. And so in this case, I've uh, changed the polynomial a bit, and we kind of repeat as before. We find it, and if you look here, you notice that neither of our two roots, or none of our two intervals that we're checking actually contain the root, so the test fails. Uh, what's nice about QIR is it falls back to bisection. Uh, bisection's pretty straightforward. We have our interval, we split it in two. We know that the root will be on one half or the other, and more importantly, all we have to do to figure out which half is, we just check the sign. Uh, in this case, the sign's negative, so we know that there's no root between the middle and the right side, because they're both negative, so we can just drop that half and we're done, and we can repeat this process, and it keeps on reducing or finding the interval. Uh, the nice thing, and the part that's important for this talk, is that bisection only requires sign tests. Um, however, it converges very slowly. But, you know, as soon as I see it requires sign tests, that means that I can use FP filter and hopefully speed up the base case where things have failed or when we first are starting and we don't have a small enough interval yet. Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to get speed up the test for actually computing the sign of the polynomial at a given point. So we have a polynomial, we have a point x, and we want to compute just the sign of that. We don't want to actually compute the value or the evaluate the, val the polynomial at that point. Um, so obviously I'm not going to go over this too much, but uh, here's the implementation that uses FP filter. It's pretty straightforward if you uh, spend some time with it. Um, and just to kind of step back and show why this is necessary, is that if we actually try to use double to do this, it's pretty terrible. So each of these lines represent random polynomials of varying degrees. Um, as the degree moves up, uh, the accuracy of our sign test drops dramatically. By the time we get, you know, not even that bad, like that's 13, I mean, uh, bits that were going down, it's basically below 50%, which is pretty amazing that it can be wrong more often than it's right. <laughs> um, but it is. And then, uh, so this is not speed up from exact sign test. This is, it is, yeah. So um, the difference here is we, we have a test that we, we were originally computing exactly as opposed to using double, and we're trying to use floating point filter to speed it up. So in this case here, what I'm showing is that we've taken our exact, with our floating point filter case, um, our, the, I guess those are red on this screen. Um, so the red cases are when we, our test uses floating point filters. And the blue slash gray ones are the tests that use double. Uh, when the lines turn gray, that means that they've basically given up on in terms of like accuracy. Um, so you can see that at least for the start, uh, we get some nice speed up. It's close to the speed of doubles. And once you, once you get past the point where doubles are no longer useful, it immediately drops down to the speed of just using the exact sign test. Um, so yeah, anyways, in summary, the 
floating point filter type. It basically works like uh, any other number type, um, except it tries to uh, be fast. And so the nice thing is, like within an expression, it'll take all of your things, it'll inline it, it'll use just pure floating point arithmetic. Every, all the uh, exact ones get turned into private methods in your class, and they eventually only get called at the end. Um, and it gets pretty close to the performance of double for cases like our, our turn test. Um, anyways, if, it, if you want to look at the code in this talk, uh, you can go to that address. It has also all the data and the benchmarks and the tests I use to calculate the accuracy and everything else. Um, that's basically it. Uh, floating point filter lives in Spire, so if you want to use floating point filter, you can go use Spire. It's great. That's it.